and I'm looking forward to it. So, Paul, I'm going to turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Joel. I trust my screen share worked. Okay. So before I get started, I want to provide a little background about myself uh, and the commission. Uh, as Joel mentioned, I'm the communications officer. I've worked for the commission since 2005. Uh, I've been gardening for about as long as I can remember. My first introduction to gardening was something called Mission Impossible. And it has nothing to do with Tom Cruise, I assure you. It has to do with my family and growing up. I'm the youngest of eight children. And growing up, we had eight children, three dogs, six or seven cats who could keep track, guinea pigs, exotic birds, and all kinds of other uh, critters to take care of. And so my parents devised Mission Impossible, which was a means to get all the children to do our chores, including yard work and including gardening. So my introduction to gardening had to do with Mission Impossible. And once we accomplished Mission Impossible by Saturday, that meant we could go out, out on the uh, family outing, of course, which was on Sunday, which entailed pizza and a movie. So you always wanted to make sure you got all of your work done at, so that you could uh, then go out in the family outing. Otherwise, it was very humiliating. So it started out as something that was more of a chore, but then it became something more of a passion. And uh, I've been gardening here at my house for since uh, the early 2000s and have put in a number of uh, Pineland species, and I have three different types of uh, milkweed that are blooming currently, and a lot of uh, butterfly type gardening uh, going on at my house, as well as uh, vegetables, which I'm sure a lot of people are also growing vegetables right now. Uh, so here at the commission, we want to lead by example. So in 2016, we put in a number of drought tolerant native Pineland species in front of our offices. And we planted things like showy aster and sweet goldenrod. Uh, showy aster is an absolute magnet for butterflies such as the common uh, buckeye you see there. Uh, we also put in um, grassleaf blazing star, Maryland golden aster. They're all thriving. And these are just examples of how we want to lead by example to the public and show that these are beautiful species. They're low maintenance. You don't have to add any uh, fertilizer or uh, any pesticides or anything for these, you, you don't even have to water them. And so these are some of the things I've been able to do at our office in addition to the bog garden, which we're going to talk about shortly. Uh, and before we get into bog gardening, I wanted to provide a little background about the Pinelands. Okay, so what is the Pinelands? Is it a national park? No, it's not a national park, but we are affiliated with the National Park Service in a way as a unit of the Park Service. The Pinelands is a vast mosaic of forests, farms, streams, and towns. In fact, it covers parts or all of 56 towns in seven counties in South Jersey. And those seven counties are Atlantic, Burlington, Cape May, Cumberland, uh, Camden, Gloucester, and Ocean. And so the Pinelands National Reserve became our country's first national reserve after the passage of the National Parks and Recreation Act of 1978 and the reserve covers 1.1 million acres or 22% of our state. So here's what the Pinelands looks like from space. So a satellite image on the left, you'll see the dark green areas. Those are areas that are forested and the yellowish areas are areas that have, uh, where there's been some development. In many cases, it's uh, agriculture. Uh, and if you look at the map on the right, you'll see that uh, the, the uh, blue areas encompass wetlands and the green areas are upland forests and approximately 80% of the Pinelands area is forests, wetlands and water. So this is a really special area. And it, and it really is an animal oasis. We are home to 500 animal species, including 43 rare animals. Those are uh, animal species that are considered either threatened or endangered. Our most famous one, of course, our poster child is the Pine Barrens tree frog. We're also a botanical treasure uh, the Pinelands provides refuge for 850 plant species, including 92 rare plants and approximately 27 species of orchids. Here's the white fringe orchid. Here's the pink lady slipper orchid. Here's the ragged fringed orchid. So we have wetlands aplenty here. Wetlands cover about 35% of the reserve. And this picture here shows you 
uh, the Webb's Mill bog in Lacey Township. Uh, and you have bladderwort and golden crest there blooming. I was there earlier this week. Uh, if anyone would like to see what a real wetland type bog looks like, I highly recommend it. It's located off Route 539 across from the Greenwood Wildlife Management Area sign uh, in Lacey Township, Ocean County. And here were pitcher plants there earlier this week. Here's Golden Crest again. So what exactly is a bog garden? Quite simply, it's a garden that has persistently moist soil consisting mostly of peat moss, but with some sand. And the idea is you're creating habitat for plants that like to stay wet, like wetland plants. And this includes many Pinelands plants. So what's, what's the story with bog gardens versus rain gardens? They seem similar, right? Are they the same thing? They're not exactly the same thing. In fact, they're not the same thing at all. Uh, and according to Rutgers and their definition, basically a rain garden is a landscape shallow depression that allows rain and snow to seep naturally into the ground. You're replenishing groundwater and it's helping to prevent non-point source pollution. On the other hand, bog gardens are typically filled with peat moss and not dirt. And peat moss is very acidic and nutrient poor. Bog gardens are always moist. Whereas rain gardens, while they're placed near downspouts where they capture rainwater, the plants in rain gardens thrive in short-term flooding of only about two days. And it also must survive during droughts. So they're not the same thing. Bog garden plants should not be allowed to go dry, unlike some of the plants in rain gardens. Rain gardens are certainly a wonderful thing, but it's not the same thing as bog garden. So those two things, just to clear that up. So why would you want to have a bog garden? Well, you're going to provide another habitat for native plants. And native plants are a better alternative to non-natives for many reasons. You're helping to support the ecosystem. You don't have to uh, take special measures to keep them alive, such as using fertilizers and amending the soil. These are plants that are meant to be here. And bog plants are just as beautiful as any non-native plant, if not more so. As you'll see in my presentation, we're talking about orchids and carnivorous plants. And many of these plants provide an important source of nectar and pollen. And by planting these unusual species, you'll raise awareness and appreciation of those species, and you'll feel more connected, connected to your natural environment. So let's talk about the Pinelands Bog Garden. So here we have a picture. It's a P-shaped raised bed that's located on our grounds. The uh, building behind is our Fenwick Manor farmhouse, which was built in the 1820s. It is on the National Register of Historic Places, as uh, has, a, has an interesting and rich history. It was the childhood home of Elizabeth White, who helped to cultivate the blueberry. And no doubt, she planted a number of things on that property. So we had this raised bed here, and at one point in the center of it was a sycamore that was very sickly and ultimately fell down. Uh, luckily, it did not fall down completely, but we had to take it out. And so since that time, it was just full of a lot of unappealing things. There were hostas and things that just didn't really seem to fit. So we decided, why wouldn't we want to also lead by example here and showcase some of the species that are so special that make this area so interesting. So we decided to create a bog garden. And so we reached out to some people we knew, uh, bog man Bill Smith and Jason Austin, who was the botanist at Rarefine Nursery in Jackson, who gave us some pointers. Uh, bog man Bill Smith is from Warren Grove. He has what is uh, uh, believed to be the largest bog garden in North America. Very nice guy. They gave us a lot of pointers on what to do and how to create our own bog. And what we did, step one, we removed the weeds and dirt, dug it all out. If you're going to do this before you dig, you should always call 1-800-272-1000 for the one call system to get a free utility mark out. You don't want to dig and accidentally rupture a gas line or, or electrical line. So we always tell you, please, call that number first. Step two, we uh, covered the raised bed with a pond liner. Now these are pond liners that are typically used if you're gonna create an ornamental pond for fish or other aquatic species. You can buy these at any uh, local garden center. 
Um, this bog here is about 20 feet long and about 12 feet or so wide where, where you have that bend in the peak. So we placed the pond liner down. You might notice on the right side, there's a, a sort of a raised area. That's where the tree trunk used to be, or still is for the sycamore. And we thought, you know, since we have that, we might as well make the best of the situation. And we put some additional uh, paving stones on top of it so that we can then, as you'll see on the left, put a large boulder there which is certainly not necessary if you're going to create a bog garden and nobody's saying you're necessarily going to create a bog garden that's 20 feet long. But the reason why we put that there is so that once we put all our soil in and when we need to, we can then stand on that and sit on that stone and weed the area because this peat moss can be quite squishy and, and, and you can sink and we don't want to either step on the plants or disrupt the root systems of the plants that are in the bog. But we just felt it was a smart idea from a uh, aesthetic standpoint, but also a functional standpoint so that we can get in there and do some weeding. So one thing too, is you're gonna wanna make some uh, slices and cuts in that uh, area of the pond liner so that there's some drainage. You do want some drainage here. You don't want the uh, peat moss to be waterlogged per se. You want it to be wet. But if, if, you, if you don't have some drainage in your bog garden, it is possible that some of the rots will, some of the roots will uh, rot a little bit on you and you don't want that. You do want some drainage. So getting peat moss can be uh, wet, can be very difficult and can be very time consuming. There's a couple tips that we'll get into later. So here's what it looks like as it's saturated. We use 30 bales of peat moss. Peat moss is very acidic and has very few nu nutrients, which is perfect for many native pinelands plants, especially those that grow in wetlands. So here's Jason Austin on the left. Uh, rare find had uh, donated a number of uh, unusual and rare species that they had propagated. None, uh, none of these species are from the woods. We don't take anything from the woods. We purchase plants. And in this case, we were fortunate to have a situation where we had a number of unusual species donated to us. And then the next round of, of plantings we purchased, but nothing comes from the woods and you should not take anything from the woods either. Uh, so we planted uh, pitcher plants, dozens of them. And in fact, those came from our chairman, Rick Prickett, who grows and propagates probably thousands of pitcher plants. No doubt he has hundreds at his house. And so he donated uh, dozens of them to us. And we planted fall sasphodel, uh, on petal meadow beauty, uh, huckleberry, and sheep laurel. And here's how we water it. So we installed a rain barrel to capture water. And we started to use this in the beginning. And the idea is rainwater is better for the bog than tap water, although we'll get into tap water and whether or not you can use that. And in fact, we have switched over uh, primarily to tap water for a number of reasons. One of which is that when you uh, use a system with a rain barrel, in our case, we would have to run a hose that would go through areas where uh, members of our staff and the public might trip over that hose. So it can be a safety issue in some cases where you'd have to put out cones, which we have, but we still use the rain barrel on occasion. It's a good idea, but we found we can also use uh, tap water. And we'll talk a little bit about whether or not tap water is something that can be used. So make sure to keep the bog moist, uh, water it at least once a week, depending on rain and various circumstances. And then you'll enjoy the blooms. On the right is a pine barrens gentian that we have blooming in our bog garden. And here's what the bog looks like now. So you'll see in the foreground, you'll see a ro rose colored coreopsis. And those are uh, over here are the blooms of the pitcher plant and Here's it from the other side. Here's what it looks like now. We have all of it marked out with plant markers. And the bog garden's really thriving. You'll see in this picture, uh, grass pink orchids. 
and you'll notice a, a uh, compact disc. You might be wondering what that is. That's an old farmer's trick where you hang compact discs in the sunlight, reflects off of the disc, and can cast different lights, different uh, uh, shafts of light onto the ground, which can then hopefully keep some of the critters out of there. We do have, in our case, uh, chipmunks living in our bog garden, which is perfectly fine. Uh, in some cases, though, they have been eating the tuberous and apparently delicious roots of the on-petal meadow beauty, which is a rare species. And so we wanted to kind of maybe nudge them along into a different area by using this compact disc, which may or may not have worked. But we found over time, as I've protected the plants, uh, that it's not really an issue anymore. So we are living in harmony with the uh, chipmunks. So here's a gallery of some of the blooms in our bog garden. On the top left is sheep laurel. On the top right, you have orange fringed or yellow fringed orchid, although it looks orange to me. Bottom left is bog asphodel. In the middle is pine barrens gentian. And on the right is on petal meadow beauty. Here's another slide with more of our blooms. On the top left is uh, I'm trying to remember the name. Uh, on the top right is our um, Turk's cap lily. Turkey beard's in the top left. For some reason, I blanked out on it. And the bottom left is swamp pink. And then the middle is New York aster, cabbage white on it. And then the bottom right is a picture of rose-colored coreopsis. Here are more blooms. Top left is golden crest in bloom. Bottom right is wand goldenrod. And then the bottom left is dwarf huckleberry. So here are some notes on soil. We mentioned earlier about using peat moss. And what you want to do is, is mix that with horticultural or washed play sand. Don't use sand from the beach. It, it has uh, salts in it, so you wouldn't want to do that. And don't use contractor sand either. It's a different type of sand. You'd want to use approximately 80% peat and 20% sand, or maybe 70% peat, 30% sand. It kind of depends in some ways on what you're planting. Uh, we used a vast majority of peat uh, as that was what was recommended for us to do by the experts. And it's important to know that peat moss holds 25% of its dry weight in water substantial. It can be very difficult to get wet in the beginning. One of the things we've discovered that you can take one of the, the bales, the cubes that you can buy in a garden center, you, you break it up and put it in a trash can and get it wet with a hose and then just keep moving it around with a shovel. Or you could cut a hole in the cube, which is, uh, you know, encased in plastic, and you would put your hose in the cube and just let it run until it saturates and soaks up the soil. You'd still want to break it up. It'd take a fair amount of time to get peat moss wet, but once you get it wet, it really stays wet for a long time. So when you're putting down your soil, you should have at least 18 inches approximately for your plants in depth. Uh, and in many cases, you can, you can get away perhaps with a little bit less if you're growing orchids, for example, primarily, and if you're growing it in a non-raised uh, uh, bed situation, if you're doing, say, a mini bog container planting, which we'll get into later, obviously you're going to want to have a deeper depth of soil if you're growing shrubs. And it's also a good idea to mulch, and you don't want to use your regular mulch that you see all over with uh, regular, uh, you know, Home Depot and Lowe's grade chipped up uh, bark. We recommend using pine needles. Uh, and this was something that was real common in the South, uh, pine straw. And you could order this online. Uh, and there's uh, numerous websites and suppliers of pine straw, and they'll have it shipped directly to you. Now, granted, you could also, if you wanted to, scoop up some of your own pine needles in your yard. However, be forewarned that that will also likely come with numerous weeds that are also hiding in that, uh, those pine needles. 
the pine straw you buy is such that it's been triple screened and so you won't have the same issue. And if you were to scoop up and put your pine needles from your yard on your bog, it would now be in that amazing planting medium and, and of peat moss, which is often used to sprout seedlings. And you're gonna find that you're gonna have all kinds of uh, weeds coming up all over and tree seeds and things that could be very difficult to keep control of. Of course, you could also use pea gravel, which is very decorative, but it's a good idea to mulch so that you can maintain moisture uh, in your bog because you don't want to have to water it too much. You don't want to have to use the precious resources of water. So here's some notes on water. It's best to use rainwater or distilled water if feasible. You could also use reverse osmosis water. However, you might be able to use tap water. If you're planning to use tap water, you want to test the total dissolved solids first. These are the, these includes uh, the inorganic salts and you can buy a total dissolved solid meter online for about 20 bucks. The amount of total dissolved solids are measured in parts per million. And according to the curious plant carnivorous plant nursery, most tap water, although it can vary, has between 100 and 400 parts per million of total dissolved solids. And most carnivorous plants can tolerate parts per million range from 50 to 140. But the lower the number, the better. Now these are, this is if you're going to put carnivorous plants in your bog. If you're using non-carnivorous plants, in many cases, tap water should not cause any problems. Uh, but we found in our bog in Pemberton we've not experienced any problems with the tap water, but your mileage may vary. And I don't wanna tell you to use tap water and then all your precious plants start to die on you. So it's a good idea if you're gonna plant carnivorous plants in your bog, if you do a total dissolved solid test of your water first, it's always recommended. And by the way, I've also uh, read that the old aquarium trick of taking water and putting it in a pitcher and allowing it to sit overnight to reduce, say, chlorine, that that, doesn't, that does not work uh, if you have high total dissolved solid numbers, it won't help you. So it's an interesting thing to learn that. So here are some of the plants that we're talking about here. We have our pitcher plant, Saracenia, and it's a carnivorous species. It obtains nutrients by eating insects. You can feed them live crickets or other insects if the plants are indoors. Uh, we have a bog terrarium in our new exhibit that has a number of pitcher plants in it. And while many people will feed them, say, crickets or other flies when they're indoor, we found that we can feed uh, them um, stink bugs, which then takes care of two problems at once. So in that case, you'll need to feed them if they're indoors, but if they're outdoors, they don't need any help. If you were to look inside of one of these pitchers, you would find they're full of water and also many bugs. Bugs are drawn to the pitcher plants. They check in and then they don't check out until they're, until they're frankly, consumed by the plant and their enzymes. And this is how the plants get their nitrogen. So, and it's a beautiful species. I find them really easy to grow. In fact, uh, you can plant them basically with, with your, your hand. You don't even need, because you're using peat moss, you don't even need a trowel. You could use your hand as a trowel to simply uh, make a depression in the soil and make space for them and their fibrous root systems, very forgiving. And you could place that in your spot, wherever you wanna put it, they will get big over time. Uh, some of the pitchers, the individual pitchers, or if you wanna consider them petals within the pitchers, will start to die back toward the edge after about two or three years. The pitcher plant itself, of course, is still alive and, and produces new pitchers from the center, which grow up. And ours are currently blooming. They've been blooming for a couple months. You'll see these sort of odd looking balls here. Those are the petals or of the, of the uh, flower. Um, and they really like full sun. 
And as they start out from the beginning uh, in, the, in the new pitchers, as they generate from the center, they're sort of greenish yellow, and then they turn red, reddish purple in bright sun over time. You don't wanna give these any fertilizer and you also do not wanna let these to go dry at all. Uh, that's one of the biggest problems. And I found if you keep them moist, they'll take care of themselves. The only thing you might ever have to do is because they get so big, it's a good idea to divide them. And that's easy to do as well. You can kind of pull up, once again, using your hand as a trowel, pull up the entire plant out of the peat moss and then kind of spread it apart with your hands. The individual pitchers will, will kind of pull apart in a clump and then you can divide it as you would any perennial and then plant it somewhere else in your bog garden. And they'll also spread by themselves if given the right conditions. You know, there's a lot of plant species that are self-seeding. Uh, in one of my um, earlier parts of my gardening experiences in for butterfly gardening, I found a number of species that were self-seeding annuals that basically replicated a, a perennial and that if you don't mulch too heavily, the seeds will drop and will germinate on the bare soil and then will fill in and come back every year. And the same kind of holds with pitcher plants. And, you know, I mentioned earlier using uh, pine straw or pine needles, well, there's a lot of holes between there and the seeds will fall out in the pitcher plants from the, the uh, blooms and then germinate. And you'll have little tiny baby pitcher plants coming up. And that's happened several times for us in our bog. And in fact, we have so many pitcher plants now, we might need to do another division and just to keep them nice and healthy and not too uh, bunched up together. Uh, we have a number of species that have kind of moved in as well. Some things that are uh, perhaps from the lawn that have jumped in there that I've been weeding out. And we want to make sure it doesn't get overtaken by some of these weeds. Because once again, peat moss is an amazing uh, medium for sprouting anything and everything. Seems like everything wants to live there, including our chipmunks. So with all of these plants that I'm gonna mention, it's important to know where can you get them. I mean, I don't wanna just tell people, hey, this is really cool, you should plant this, but you can't find it anywhere, that's no fun. So ours, we've seen, of course, ours were, once again, were donated to us by uh, Rick Prickett, but they are certainly available and you can buy them online. I've seen them at uh, plant sales. You know, we have every year our Pineland short course and we've had that uh, for over 30 years. And in some cases we've had rare find uh, come when they were selling this particular variety of pitcher plant, which is our native species. They currently sell other species at rare find according to their catalog. They have a yellow one. It's the non-native one, but certainly you might wanna consider that uh, in your bog container if you can't find another kind, we would recommend going with the native one, which you can buy uh, at the Carnivorous Plant Nursery, which is carnivorousplantnursery.com. That's in Maryland. And uh, we've checked into them uh, a few years ago when we put in our Pinelands exhibit. We needed to, we wanted to include some other types of species which we didn't have, such as uh, sundews. And there's three different types of sundews that they have, all of our native uh, sundew species. So we checked into them and they are responsible in that they do not take anything from the woods, just like the plants we received from uh, Rare Find. They were propagated according to all the rules and they sell these online. So I would recommend checking them out. We did purchase some plants from them for our exhibits and they come wrapped in uh, sphagnum moss around the roots. They were all pretty healthy. Uh, everything lived for a period of time, although I will note is very challenging to grow sundews for a long time in an indoor type situation. Uh, but outdoors, they seem to do better. So here's the bog or yellow asphodel. This is a beautiful species, really small and dainty. 
and I've taken a picture up close that makes it seem like it's a big plant, but it's a really small plant. It's only about six to eight inches tall and wide, kind of grows in grassy clumps. And this is a special species because it's currently thought to be found only in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey and nowhere, nowhere else currently. Of course, having said that, I'm sure someone's gonna point out that that's not true and, and I, I welcome that, but that was uh, the information that I have on this species, but it's a beautiful plant and it prefers full sun to partial shade. Uh, it's currently available also at Rare Find according to its catalog, 2020 catalog. So you can buy this one, uh, beautiful species. Another one is the false asphodel. This is a white six petaled star-like uh, flower species that uh, flowers atop grassy stalks. And, and it's a big spreader. Just a, a cautionary tale here with some of these and spreading could be a good thing if that's what you want uh, and you want it to naturalize, which I happen to like gardens that naturalize. But if you're concerned about having a bog garden that will be overtaken by different species that might outcompete other species that you want to encourage, like some of the orchids that may not be able to uh, hold their own, say, against some of, say, shrubs or something like false asphodel. It's just, just a cautionary tale that it will spread. And so just proceed with caution as it spreads. It's about 10 to 15 feet tall and 10 to 12 inches wide. Although once again, it will spell, spread by rhizomes. And so it, it will naturalize and in many cases take over large portions of your bog as it is in our case it is really spreading, uh, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. You know, gardens are always going to do that. Uh, there's, if you want to control it in such a way or make it more aesthetically pleasing, you always have the option of say, digging out the, the, the uh, spread, uh, the spreading rhizomes and perhaps giving them to a friend. So that is currently available as well at Rare Fine Nursery, according to their catalog. I've not seen it anywhere else. Um, Virginia Meadow Beauty, it's a beautiful plant, one of our most showy plants that you could plant in your garden. There's magenta flowers in midsummer, grows one to two feet tall, prefers full sun to partial shade. It's an absolute magnet for butterflies and other pollinators. This one to me is a must. If you're gonna have a bog garden, I really think this is one you should strongly consider unless you just want to do one that has say just carnivorous plants, pitcher plants and sundews. Uh, I think this is just a beautiful plant that you can bring to your uh, garden in your house. And it's currently available at Earth First Natives Nursery and I provided the link here. Uh, it can also be purchased as seeds. This is one that's such a beautiful plant. You often see this at native uh, plant sales. And as many of our viewers may know, there are numerous native plant cells throughout New Jersey throughout the year, perhaps not as many as we would like and given the current circumstances, uh, that could be a challenge, but uh, Pinelands Preservation Alliance has native plant sales. Uh, I went to a native plant sale last year at Clemenson Nursery in uh, Estelle Manor. They had just a tremendous selection of uh, native plants. A lot of the ones that we're talking about can be found, but maybe not. Uh, it's something always look into. I know a lot of the, um, at these plant sales, they'll provide you with a listing of, of the availability of the plants they're going to have. And one of the challenges in general with native planting is there, while there's a number of wholesale distributors, uh, you're not going to purchase, say, a hundred of anything. Uh, and those and in those cases, there are thankfully retail operators or retail days for those wholesalers or an example of Pinelands Nursery, Pinelands Direct and, and, and uh, new uh, avenues for people to sell at retail uh, many of these amazing native species that we really encourage you to plant. So once again, Virginia Meadow Beauty is a beautiful species, also a spreader, just a tremendous plant. New York aster is another species that certainly can grow in a bog and, and take over. 
uh, we, we purchased ours at a native plant sale and it is now everywhere in the bog. And I'm constantly pulling out portions of it and uh, then putting them in the regular ground where they're growing just as well. Uh, asters are, are an excellent species to plant for butterflies and bees and moths. And we have uh, the New York aster on one end of the, we planted it on one end of the bog. And before we knew it, about a year later, it was on the other end of the bog. So it had really spread quickly. And I've taken so many pictures of bu different butterflies on our New York asters, I've kind of lost count. Uh, and w as I mentioned, because it's such a spreader, you want to proceed with caution. It'll spread by rhizome and, and it will go underneath, the rhizomes will go underneath the uh, pitcher plants and then on the other side, and in some cases through the pitcher plant. And so trying to deal with that can be a challenge if you wanna, the pitchers seem to still be alive, but it kind of impedes their growth as well sometimes. And so you might wanna be careful in planting this species if you wanna have your pitcher plants grow unimpeded. Uh, it is currently available at Pinelands Direct Nursery and Earth First Natives. And this is really pretty common species uh, at native plant sales, not hard to find. But, but a great species to plant, ultimately. I think perhaps our showiest one is the Turk's cap lily. It looks a lot like a tiger lily. These plants are, are just awesome. Uh, it's a showstopper with blooms from early to mid-summer. Uh, and according to the research and according to our experience, it can grow easily up to six feet tall and have, uh, in some cases, we're told dozens of blooms on them of that size. Now ours, the most we've had, uh, I think is maybe 15, uh, but it keeps getting larger and taller each year. And as such, given that it's growing in that uh, peat moss, you're gonna wanna provide a stake for support. Um, it thrives in full sun, and it's another species that uh, butterflies are just drawn to. Uh, and it's beautiful. So you can uh, get this online via numerous nurseries, including native wildflowers.net. There's a, it's, it's a, uh, not that hard to find a seed either, I think. Um, it has been available at Rarefind, and I know that because we purchased it from them. Uh, it is not, according to our catalog, it's not currently available, but I really would look into this one as uh, a plant you'd want to put in your bog garden. So let's get to some of the orchids. We have grass pink orchid, uh, which is in bloom right now. Uh, ours is blooming and it is spreading, which is a good thing. It, it's so uh, pretty looking and striking. And it's, we find that each year, I sort, I sort of worry a little bit, is it gonna come back? And before you know it, not only does it come back, it's, it's already blooming. It kind of starts from nothing and grows up really quickly. Uh, and it will colonize. This is one I would recommend for sure uh, to put in your bog. Uh, it's available from the Carnivorous Plant Nursery in Maryland, according to their website. You could buy that online. Once again, do not take anything from the woods. Uh, I saw this is blooming uh, all throughout the Pinelands right now. And here's another one, orange or yellow fringed orchid. This is a, a plant, an orchid species that has bright orange blooms, or in some cases yellowish in late July to late August. It grows in full to partial sun. It grows eight inches to 16 inches. You could purchase this online from Carnivorous Plant Nursery in Maryland. And uh, we know this because we purchased the, uh, some from them last year, or two years ago. And I should note all the pictures I'm showing you except for one or two are from our actual bog. So this is the picture here of the uh, orange fringed orchid blooming in our bog. And I, we were a little concerned that we, weren't, we wouldn't be able to provide enough moisture for this species, but it's growing just fine. And not only is it growing just fine, it's spreading as well, which is great. Rose pagonia is another orchid that's uh, blooming right now. Uh, and I saw this at Webb's Mill Bog earlier this week. Uh, you have blooms from mid-June to early July. It prefers full to partial sun, uh, grows two inches to six inches, and can sometimes spread. And in fact, sometimes it could disappear and then reappear. In our case, uh, there were some years where, where we couldn't find it. Uh, we have had it for a number of years. 
kind of disappeared and then magically there it is it's back again which is great uh, and you could purchase this from the carnivorous plant nursery in maryland although they are currently sold out and sometimes you can find it at rare find um, and here's some of the sundews round leaf sundew this is another carnivorous plant species this one has sticky traps these are tiny dainty little plants here uh, that grow one inch to two inches they prefer full to partial sun uh, this is one of the sundews that can grow and can be grown in bog terrariums. Um, after speaking to some of the people who I know who are into bog gardening, they had cautioned that, yes, you can grow these indoors in terrariums, but they don't tend to live very long in that type of environment. It's best to live them out, uh, to plant them outside and allow them to live in that environment. Uh, with any of these, uh, bogs that we have, whether it's our bog terrarium that we have in our exhibit or our bog garden at the office, the idea of it in many cases is that it's a demonstration garden. We want to demonstrate to the public that this is what we have growing here in the Pinelands. And in many cases, people won't be able to see these species because either they don't know where they are or they, they're perhaps leery about venturing out into the woods and, and uh, grappling with all the various bugs such as ticks and, and other biting insects that they might encounter. So we're providing the, we're bringing the Pinelands to the public through these bog gardens and terrariums and showing them, look at these amazing species we have growing here with the idea, the more that we raise awareness uh, of these species, the more people will appreciate them. And in the end, hopefully people will then support our protection of these species. So this is one here that uh, you can see at the Webb's Mill uh, bog in Lacey that I mentioned earlier, if you look closely enough and know where to look, it's definitely, that you can find these there and they're available for purchase at the Carnivorous Plant Nursery in Maryland. Spatulate leaf sundew is another one that you can also purchase from uh, that nursery and it has spatula shaped leaves, which is where it gets its name. It flowers from June to August with uh, about three to eight white flowers, grows about one inch to three inches, can be grown indoors once again. Uh, it prefers full to partial sun. And here's the threadleaf sundew, which is the tallest of all of our sundews, which grows four inches to above a foot, prefers full sun to partial sun, and it flowers from May to June. As you see in this picture, here's a picture with the flower up top. It is available for purchase at that same nursery. And I thought I would put in uh, an example of a shrub because I think, you know, depending on the size of your bog, like if you're gonna grow a bog as big as the one we have, you might wanna consider it. But if you're gonna grow a smaller one, I'm not sure that's a good idea. And the reason for that is this particular species, among many others, uh, will spread and can take over. Uh, and if that's not an issue, then that's fine but we found in the one that we received uh, as a donation, it, uh, it was part of a clump that included several other species, including dangleberry and, and uh, huckleberry, and it has kind of taken over in some ways, but it's a beautiful species in, all on its own, uh, and it is commercially uh, available online, and of course it's related to the mountain laurel, and, but it's, it's just, a wonderful plant to have in your garden. If you can grow it in non-bog conditions as well, I'd recommend that. It grows about five to six feet tall and wide. And ours bloomed a few weeks ago and I posted a number of photos of it blooming on our Facebook page. So, so here's some alternatives. You don't need to have a big uh, bog like the one we created. You can have a container uh, bog garden or a mini bog as you see on the right. Uh, Here's an example from Rare Finds website where you can buy it as a kit and you could also uh, schedule an appointment, or at least you could schedule an appointment uh, prior to our current circumstances uh, to learn more about how to create a bog garden. And I have here a link that I wanna share real quick, if we can get to it. Here's an example uh, of how, here's some directions on how to grow your carnivorous plants in a mini bog container. And this is from the Brooklyn Botanical Garden. And so what you'd wanna do, 
and I'll provide this link on our website as well. You could purchase a uh, rigid liner from any garden center, about nine gallon black liner. And then you would also have a about six inch tall pot in the center with drainage holes. You would put in uh, lava rock, as you'll see here. And there's that pot we showed earlier. You know, the, per per uh, the reason to have that pot, the purpose is to, for watering. So you fill around the pot with peat moss and sand. And then you could water it in the center. And then you plant whatever species you want to plant. In this case, is that they're recommending two different types of pitcher plants, the trumpet pitcher, which is not a native to Pinelands, but purple pitcher plant is a native. And they're here they're showing the uh, grass pink orchid as an example. And there's their final product there. Uh, and they, as you'll see, they've used um, pine straw or pine needles for, as a mulch. So when it's complete, you could put that on your patio or a small yard, or even on, in this case, they say even on your rooftop. Uh, and once established, it doesn't require a lot of maintenance. Just weed it and keep it watered. And, and it will overwinter in some cases. You might, depending on your circumstances, with any potted plant, you may want to uh, bury it in soil, perhaps. Uh, that wouldn't be a bad idea, depending on your situation. So let's get back to the presentation here. So that's an example of, of a bog container garden, which is not a bad idea because uh, you could start out small and, and learn about how to do it. And here's our bog terrarium inside of our exhibits. As you see, we've got peat moss and sand and, and uh, different pictures, a lot of pictures in there. There it is up close, a lot of moss. So you might wonder, how do we get to it? Well, it comes out so that we can water it and maintain it. And so here's some tips for bog garden success. You want it like with any garden, uh, you want to pick the right spot. Think about sunlight. If you're growing plants that do best in full sun, put your bog in the most sunny spot you can find. And that means six or more hours of direct sunlight. Uh, and always with all garden practicing, pick the right plants for the right spot. Don't try to go up against nature. Although sometimes you can make it work, you wanna pay close attention to sunlight, soil and spacing requirements. You know, some plants don't like to be jammed together. Certainly certain species like uh, the New York aster can develop in some cases powdery mildew and can look kind of sickly if you plant things too close together and they will compete with each other and all plants will spread and fill in. And in general, when it comes to gardening, instant gratification can be overrated. It's best to have patience and you're gonna be rewarded. As you see in some of our pictures earlier of our bog, it was very sparse and look at how uh, thickly uh, it's grown, thick it has grown in over the, over the past couple of years. It's always a good idea to plant in layers, uh, plant taller plants or shrubs in the back or in the middle if you have a circular bog. The shorter herbaceous plants and, and the more dainty orchids should be planted in front where they'll have time or, or they'll have, they won't have to compete with the bigger plants and shrubs for sunlight and roots and where they can be readily enjoyed and seen. It's a good idea to start small and get used to bog garden plants and watering routines. And you wanna keep the bog wet. And overall, don't get discouraged if something doesn't live. Uh, you know, with all gardening, I, I can't tell you how many plants I've had over the years that just for some reason, they're just, they don't make it. Despite all my best efforts, uh, sometimes it just doesn't work. It's part of the adventure, I think. It's part of what uh, gardening is all about. And with bog gardens, we've had a number of species that we planted in the beginning that just didn't like it. Whereas others did, like Golden Crest, we were told needs more moisture than what we were able to provide. And it was experimental to put them in, but we did it and now they're doing really well. So you just never know. And also lastly, get creative. Here's a picture of a bathtub bog garden uh, and the source is Saracenia Northwest uh, website. This is from YouTube. They have a number of videos and there's several other people on YouTube. If you just put in bathtub bog garden, you'll see examples and, and demonstrations on how to grow your bog garden in a bathtub. It's all the same idea, 
uh, except you know, you're gonna use a, an old bathtub, which is kind of ornamental, and you'll put a little screen where the drain hole is on the bathtub, and it does kind of grow in pretty densely over time. And with that, that is the end of my presentation, and it's time for questions. So if you have any questions, uh, please call in at the number above. We've provided the meeting ID number. And to re please remember to mute your computer while calling in so that we can avoid echoing. Uh, there is a 30 second delay between the YouTube stream and the live call in. So Joel, uh, do we have any callers? Uh, not currently, we have not received any uh, calls as of yet. Um, if one does come in, I will uh, put them through so they'll be live. Okay. Hope I didn't speak too fast. No, it was a, a very detailed, very informative uh, program. And uh, I'm sure there's a bunch of people out there just getting ready to go out and start their own, uh, their, their own project. Wow, I think it'd be a great idea. This is a good time to take on those types of projects. And in fact, when we built our bod garden, it was kind of contrary to everything you would think about planting from the standpoint that it was, I want to say July when we put it in and we're thinking, well, you don't want to put plants in in July because of the sunlight and the heat, but because you're working with peat moss, it's, it's a little bit different. It's very easy to work with peat moss once it's wet. And the plants that we put in are so durable, uh, including the pitcher plants, that they certainly did not mind, as you recall, putting them in in July. And they yeah, yeah you know, you can't really overstate the um, the time it takes to get that peat wet. It's something you really got to uh, have some patience with because it really, especially if using a large amount, you need a lot of water and uh, it's certainly something that's not going to take right away. We do have a caller. I'm going to put him through right now. Hello, you are live with your question. Hi, Joel. Uh, this is Mark Lobauer. Paul, I, I'm sorry, I'm a little hoarse today, but uh, Paul, I really enjoyed this presentation. Uh, I, I'd like to know if you could speak a little bit about uh, spreading out the, the blossoms over the summer season. I mean, you talked a bit about uh, when some of those uh, flowers, you know, the asphodels, the Sundews when they begin to blossom. I didn't say much about when they end, and uh, I would love to plant a bog garden that would have blossoms occurring throughout the summer. I is that possible? Yes, uh, it depends on the species. So a number of them don't bloom for a real long time, but the but there are several that do. So one example, although I didn't highlight it as a species, the rose-colored coreopsis, which you can find. Uh, at, at a number of garden centers, it, it does spread. Um, it blooms for for months, and that's one. It's almost like a ground cover. It's low growing, and that's one you could put in there that would bloom for a long period of time. We did design the bog garden so that it could have a bloom of some type from basically uh, April on. Uh, one of the first ones to bloom is the swamp pink, and ours. Uh, I didn't highlight Swamp Pink because it's not really available uh, commercially as it's a uh -huh. endangered species. So, uh, but there are a number of species that do bloom longer. Uh, I can get you that information. I could post some information on our website about the bloom times. On our website, we have a, a fact sheet uh, that was put together by a botanist that lists bloom times and blooming schedules for orchids throughout the pine lands. <laughs> so that's also mm -hmm. helpful. Another thing we also have is a fact sheet on our website that lists native pinelands plant species recommended for the landscape. And that includes everything, uh, uh, trees and shrubs and uh, herbaceous species, all are on our, our website and the specific type of, of plants that you wanna grow that are definitely native and are vetted and are worthwhile growing. So I hope that helped. Oh, that's terrific. Thanks very much. All right, thank you. Okay, we also have another caller. 
uh, trees and shrubs and uh, herbs. Hello, you are live with your question? Yeah, hi, I was wondering if you could uh, have the speaker um, point out uh, some nice places for the public to walk to see some of the box. Oh, yeah. So earlier I mentioned uh, Webb's Mill. That's a tremendous location to see uh, this type of, uh, of uh, wetland and uh, all the plants, many of the plants that I mentioned earlier. That's on Route 5 okay. in Ocean County, uh, easily accessible. Okay. And the beauty there is that it has a, a, uh, a boardwalk, like it's a, like an aluminum boardwalk that allows you to walk right. over and inspect the plants. Um, that's one of the best places to go to see a lot of these sites. Joel might be able to help me out with other examples. Of you know, a, another good example is uh, particularly along the Batona Trail, which is uh, a trail that runs through three state forest yeah. areas in the Pinelands, where the trail right, runs right. through some of the wetland areas, particularly the cedar swamps. You'll really get to see a lot of these plants in nature. Uh, and uh, that's a, a great place. It walks right through the swamps and you're Again, in most cases on a boardwalk and uh, you can really uh, see how they are, you know, by themselves uh, in natural. Okay, terrific. Okay, thank you so much. All right, thanks. Okay, we are open. If anyone else would like to call in, we are uh, um, free and available. One thing I just wanted to note, with any trip out into the Pinelands, it's, it's always wise, and especially this time of year, to prepare for biting insects and ticks. So, you know, prepare yourself for that possibility. Yeah, and, and along those notes, uh, you know, a couple easy things. You can wear long socks. A lot of people wear two pairs of socks, maybe one long pair of socks, and then another pair of socks outside of their pants to, to keep the ticks from getting in. And then uh, if you are going to spend, you know, any time at all, really in a grassy area or the woods, uh, you do want to physically check each, each night. I'll, when I get home from the field, I'll take some time right away and I'll, I'll just do a thorough check for ticks because some of them are small, particularly this time of year. There's some of the larval and nymph sized ticks and you can barely see them. And uh, once they bite you, you'll be quite aggravated for a while. So it's good to take those uh, precautions. Yes, I've learned the hard way over the years, for sure. But uh, I went out yesterday and I took precautions and, I, and I, everything worked out. Yep, I definitely wouldn't uh, warrant people or ex ask people to go out in flip flops because that's a problem. We do have another caller, I'll admit right now. Hello? Uh, hello, you are live. Hi, I had a question for you. Um, is there a way to grow like a pitcher plant or bog plant in my pond, like in a floating planter? You know, that's a good question. And in fact, uh, I've done that. Uh, I used to have an ornamental pond uh, that had um, fish in it, which I have since given to my colleague, Joel, who's also on here. Uh, we uh, eliminated the pond after a period of time, but it can grow. Um, I don't know that it's the best uh, environment for it, especially if you do have fish because of the nitrogen being produced by the fish. Now, mine lived for several years in a pond. Um, it probably could work. I'd have to do a little research more other than beyond my personal experience with it. It was in a pond for several years and it lived. If that's okay, all. or just other kinds of bog plants would they perhaps work? I'm just looking for some interest in it and since it's already been built uh it's not like i can create a little side bog area which sure you know i would have liked to have done well there I, might, I, might be better off planting a number of aquatic uh pineland species in there uh and those are certainly available things like white water lily and um I, i'm trying to think of some of some of the other golden club uh, and then um, uh, pickerel weed, which is a beautiful plant that you can find. It's purple, and that will grow really well in a pond. And that yeah, is I have that, and it, it goes oh. like crazy. Okay, right. So you already know. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I didn't do that much research on growing bog plants in ponds, but other than my one experience of growing a pitcher plant in a bog, which it seemed to have worked, I, it was in a uh, ornament, um, a uh, aquatic pot that had aquatic soil and or soil in it uh, as you're no doubt familiar with those types of pots 
it did work, but I, I can't really necessarily recommend it because I don't know enough about it. Okay. Well, it's worth taking. I'll give it a shot. Okay. Thanks well, a lot. Good. It was a great presentation too. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I've had some success in some of my uh, ponds where there's a shelf where I've put uh, non-aquatic plants basically within the pot on the shelf, which kind of keeps them separated from the pond. Uh, and they do tend to stay relatively moist in that area. But with That's pitcher good. plants in particular, that seemed to work pretty well. So you're, you're, you've been able to grow pitchers in your pond too? Yeah, absolutely. There's usually an area where there's a shelf and on that shelf, I put individual pots that are weighted that sit right on the shelf and they're just kind of above the water line. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's not uh, that much dissimilar to what I had in my ornamental pond. And I find pitcher plants are just so durable. I mean, I think the biggest thing is just keep them wet. Uh, I, I, I don't recall actually losing a single pitcher plant in all the plants that we've uh, put in. If anything, we have way more than we started with. Yep. All right, we have another caller I'll put on through. Hello, you are live with your question. Yes, I have an old pool that I sort of let go and I was considering uh, making it into a pond, kind of a maybe a pine lance type of pond and uh, wondered if you have any uh, recommendations or guidance on how to do that. Hmm. That's interesting. Uh, I, I don't know that, um, I'm sure people have done that before. And in fact, I heard from someone recently who was talking about getting rid of their pool and doing the same type of thing. I don't have any experience with that, with converting a, a, a pool into a pond, but I think it certainly could be done. I don't see why it couldn't be done. And then you could grow any number of aquatic species in there. And in, and in many cases, perhaps some of these uh, carnivorous species such as pitcher plant could also be grown in there. Um, Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of experience with uh, that type of, of garden, um, but uh, other than just previously having an ornamental pond, which I had, you certainly could put water lilies and other things in there and they'll grow really, really easily, especially uh, if you have full sunlight situation. Do you have full sun? It's partial sun. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you probably could grow a number of things in there. Uh, that are Pinelands aquatic species. And as I mentioned earlier, we have on our website, and I can, can provide this link uh, after uh, the meeting, or if you want to email me at uh, info at info at pinelands.nj.gov, or just go to our website and uh, send an email to any one of those addresses, I can send you a link and some information to that fact sheet I mentioned, which includes recommended aquatic species to plant that you could put in your uh, converted pond. I appreciate that. Now you mentioned you had a pond and you uh, you got rid of it. Uh, can can you, you share some of your experiences with that? Okay, so it was a really small pond. It was about, I'd say maybe 30 to 40 gallons. It was one of those pre-made uh, kidney bean shaped ponds that I inherited when I purchased the house. And uh, one of the issues for me, I felt because of the size of it, unlike larger ponds, it was harder to maintain because I had fish in there and the filtration system and all the, I, my house backs up to about 20 acres of woods and all the leaves that would fall in would then break down and create issues in the pond itself of too much uh, nitrogen loading and, and algae and, and trying to maintain the filtration system. And then also making sure that in that case, because it was a smaller pond, it could actually freeze solid. And the recommendation was if you have fish in there, that you should have a small heater to break the surface so that some of the gases can escape um, you know, under the ice. Uh, now, in your case, I don't know that it would freeze over entirely where that would be an issue at all. Joel could probably give his experiences on having a pond because he has a bigger pond than mine uh, was. And so we just felt it was too much maintenance to deal with this pond. And so at the same time, we also put a, a deck on that place of, the, it was just a personal um, sort of 
decision to get rid of the pond because of the maintenance, but but more about because we were putting in a new deck. Right. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks. Uh, I have had a relatively similar experience. Uh, I was uh, kind of inherited a long, maybe 25 foot by three foot deep uh, concrete pond. And uh, over time, the concrete started to leak. So we put a liner in and uh, that pond's done great. I've got a variety of lilies, a variety of um, uh, plants, lots of, uh, we didn't have fish originally, but now we have fish. Uh, and one of the side effects is there's a lot of dragonflies and they seem to really do a great job with the mosquitoes in our backyard. So uh, the one precaution, we do worry about the leaves. So come fall, I'll put a, a net over top just to keep the leaves out because all those leaves eventually fall down and get the bottom kind of mucky. Um, I don't have filtration because it's so big. I just run a few fountains and a few waterfalls and just try to keep the water generally running. And with the addition of the fish, uh, between the fish and the dragonflies, I have no mosquito problem whatsoever at all. Ah, there it is. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I have a built-in pool, just as you described, and I've had the same, ex I kind of let it go, and I've had the same exact experience. Uh, the frogs have moved in. There's no mosquitoes. Uh, I thought I'd have a mosquito problem, and I think the frogs are just chomping on them and uh, all the other you know insects. And now I just want to make it more of a controlled environment. Let's put it that way. Yeah, I mean I've I've done some maintenance over the years. This is why I use the netting. And uh, so every couple of years, without the net, I'd go into the bottom and really take out some of that muck. But since I use a net now in the fall, it seems to really prevent that extra. Uh, debris coming in and, and breaking breaking down. Huh, interesting. Well, thanks again. Yeah, one thing I'll note that it did attract uh, a number of species to my pond. I would have box turtles sometimes be around it, but definitely snakes would bask next to it. And one year I had a frog living in it. it will I've had egrets fly in. Yeah. yeah well, that, that's something you got to watch out for too. Yeah, if you have fish, no doubt the either whether it's those types of birds or perhaps a neighborhood cat might get to your fish because I've had in some cases fish would just disappear. How about on the subject of fish uh, for the uh, person who was discussing the pool? What did you stock your pool with fish? Uh, what was your experience? Uh, it was a really hit or miss. You know, we actually had some turn up that we didn't know how how they got into the pond. And then over time, so I had the, uh, a few friends gave me some of their fish and we've just put, added, added them in as uh, time has gone along. Um, but at one point in time, we had no fish at all and that was on purpose. And then out of the blue, I started finding fish. So I'm really not sure how they got there. Could have been dropped in, may have been there all along in the mud, but uh, that, that's always been a mystery. Huh. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right, thanks for calling. Yeah, I've got a variety of uh, frogs, uh, lots of uh, either um, southern gray or northern gray tree frogs come through. And right now they're in the yard making a lot of noise every night. There's certainly a few resident green frogs that are in the backyard. Uh -huh. I've seen the occasion of uh, spring peepers for sure. And uh, they all are drawn to that particular area. Um, oh, yeah. I also have a resident gardener snake, which I've seen in the pond. I've seen next to the pond. And uh, I think he has, uh, you know, part of the diet is his, there's some of the baby fish, because that's the only reason I would see him crawling up into the pond, which I've caught him in the pond a few times. Oh, yeah. Makes sense. So do we have any other callers? Uh, not currently. Right now, all the lines are open. If anybody else wants to call in, please feel free to. Uh, we can stay open maybe for about another three minutes or so if there's someone out there. Um, it's about seven minutes after 11. Yep, I hope everyone enjoyed the presentation. It's been fun working on the bog and, and experimenting. And I had mentioned that other uh, garden that we put at the commission's headquarters, which is just the opposite of that. So we're supportive of all different types of uh, gardens as long as they are using native species.
just uh, if anyone's still listening, I'll let you know that next week's program is going to be Jen Balava, and she's going to be presenting a program on um, lichen and fungi in the area, some of the native lichen and fungi, and uh, it'll be again, same story, 10 o'clock uh, in the morning on Thursday, and uh, that'll be uh, next, next Thursday. All right, great. All right, last call for questions. Well, great job, Paul. It was a very informative program. It's some great pictures. Uh, really neat to see some of those uh, rare pinelands plants up close. You know, some of the earliest education programs about the pinelands were really based on those bog garden plants or there's bog plants, you know, out in some of those natural savannas. And uh, that's one of the really uh, unique parts about the Pinelands is we have these savanna areas where the water table comes to the surface and that provides this beautiful environment for many of these orchids and uh, some of those showier plants that we saw today. And like I said, Webb's Mill is a great spot. It's uh, 6.2 miles north of the intersection of uh, Route 539 and Route 72. And it's part of the Greenwood Wildlife Management Area uh, Route 539 runs right through uh, the portions of uh, that wildlife management area. Yeah, and I wanted to note too, when people ask where they can see these plants, well, you could come visit us once we reopen. Our offices are currently closed given the uh, coronavirus circumstances, but our offices, once they reopen, uh, you could come visit our exhibit and also take a look at our bog garden. All right, on that note, I think I'm going to uh, shut down the stream. Again, thanks a lot, Paul. That was a great program. All right, thank you very much. T take care, everyone.